Welcome everybody to the Kinexus webinar. And uh, my name is Greg Jacobson. I'm gonna be your host. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kinexus. And Mark Graben, who is a senior advisor at Kinexus is going to be presenting about how to use process behavior charts to improve, really looking at case studies. Let's get into introducing Mark Graben. I'm, I'm, Mark and I have, have known each other personally and been working together professionally for almost seven or maybe eight years at this point. And I think most people that are probably on this webinar know Mark and don't need a formal introduction. But um, so I'll, I'll kind of forego that. All of his stats are on the slide here. I think the most important thing to know about what Mark's been thinking about the last couple of years has really been looking at data and trying to differentiate signal versus noise. And he's put all of these concepts in a book that he's recently published called Measures of Success. I think it's an excellent read. I highly recommend it. And if you are intrigued by this webinar, then you certainly should pick up a copy and you can get that in all the kind of normal places that you can get books as well. So without further ado, let's kick this over to Mark and uh, talk to us about how to use process behavior charts to improve. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. So I just want to touch on real quick, you know, what is a process behavior chart? I'm going to share a lot of different uses of process behavior charts. I'm going to draw on some workplace data, but I'm also going to draw on data that's publicly available, the types of things you might see in the news, because um, sometimes for one, this data is easier to access sometimes than, or it's easier to share than uh, data within different organizations. And I, and I think we can learn about the method and hopefully this will inspire you to go back and use process behavior charts in different ways in your organization. So I've done previous webinars on the subject you can find these in our Kinexus webinar library. You can find them on YouTube. You can Google them. So I did a webinar a couple of years ago about managing metrics using process behavior charts. There's a separate bonus content recording uh, on the how-to steps of how to create a process behavior chart, aka a control chart. And back in October, uh, we did kind of a, a goofy one. It was on Halloween. Um, so uh, was in a costume and we talked about metrics and statistics don't have to be scary. But if you don't like the creative version of it, there are um, more straightforward versions there. But just to give a quick recap, a process behavior chart, you can see an example pictured here. It's basically a run chart. In Excel, it's called a line chart. The blue dots and the lines are the data for this metric. And we not only plot that, we also calculate and plot an average. And we also calculate and plot what are called the lower and upper natural process limits. Now, um, these are calculated. Those previous webinars talk about how they're calculated. But the key is really in how we use a process behavior chart, how we help leaders use a process behavior chart. So here we see a metric that is basically just fluctuating around an average. We could say all of these data points represent noise. There's really no explanation to be had for asking why was any one particular day different than another? We could call this a predictable metric because we might not like the level of performance, but the good news is that it's going to likely remain predictable, that future performance is gonna fall somewhere between those lower and upper limits. Now, if we don't like that level of performance, instead of asking why about a single data point, we want to figure out how to improve the system. So here's a process behavior chart with noise. Well, how do we find signals? A signal tells us that a data point or a group of data points are not likely to be just randomly occurring, that something has changed in the system. So one signal we, we see is any data point that's outside the lower and upper limits. That is a signal that's a good time, an appropriate time to ask why, what happened, what changed? Was it something that just occurred or was it something that we did? A second type of signal is eight consecutive data points above or below the baseline average. That's also unlikely to be randomly occurring. That's a signal that something has changed in the system and hopefully we know what that is. And a third rule, is looking for a cluster of either three consecutive or three out of four 
data points that are closer to one of the limits than they are to the average. This is also unlikely to be randomly occurring. So um, using process behavior charts retrospectively. So um, we can ask, did something really change significantly in the system or not? Is there a signal or is there just noise? So I saw in the Wall Street Journal um, not too long ago. Here is probably the least relatable kind of example I could use looking at uh, white truffle prices. You've got to be a bit of a, a foodie and this is expensive food, but there is data here. Foodies rejoice, white truffle prices sink. Lows not seen in more than a decade. Prices are less than half. They're averaging less of half than what they were last year. So we have these descriptive words, but that doesn't really tell us if the difference in truffle prices is really meaningful or significant. Now the Wall Street Journal showed a chart. You could call this a column chart. I don't think this is necessarily as good as uh, a line chart for, for a number of reasons. But here we see data going back to 2006. And huh, prices are higher some years than others due to uh, a number of factors. But the question is, are those prices really significantly different or are they fluctuating within a predictable range? Yes, it's true that 2018 prices are half that of a year before, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a statistical signal. So if we plot truffle prices as a process behavior chart, so for one, we have a line chart, but then we calculate an average going back to 2006. Uh-huh, some years are above average, some years are below. We calculate our lower and upper um, process behavior limits. And then we also add, if we wanna really be technically precise, not just the plot of the data that we call an X chart, but we can also plot the moving ranges. Now the moving range is the absolute value of the difference between any two years. So we can look at the X chart. Well, we don't see any data points outside the limits. We have nothing but noise. We look in the MR chart. There's no data point above the upper MR limit that would suggest a year to year change that was um, significantly different than previous years. Like I, here I would look and say, I don't really know what the headline is about. That yes, it might be interesting that prices are lower than last year and that prices are lower than the three previous years. But it does, you know, we, we think what's gonna happen next year? Well, truffle prices are gonna fall somewhere between the lower and upper limit, unless something significantly changes. If worldwide demand for white truffles increases, we might see a data point up above uh, the upper limit. If demand for truffles falls uh, off um, dramatically, we might see a signal. So we see a lot of news headlines that sort of portray a signal when it's really a matter of noise. So we can use the charts retrospectively to, to look back over time. We can also use process behavior charts moving forward. Once we've established a process behavior chart and we add data points, we can ask if it's a uh, signal or if it's noise. And that will help us understand how we might need to go about improving performance of the system. So we look at webinar registrations for today. Well, we had 352 registrations. That's the second most of any webinar this year. We could also describe that registrations today are above average. We could also say, well, registrations are up 26.6% from the last month. All those statements are true, but they don't really give us a lot of insight into the performance of our system. Should I respond and say, well, today, hooray, I should pat myself on the back and, and, and or, or should, I be up, should I be upset or you know, should I really react too much um, to, to any data point? So we're gonna kind of frame the rest of the examples here. This might be the world's least interesting game show. Is it a signal? And I don't know our host's name. I don't know if we have uh, someone named Pat in the audience. If you're in the audience, you can kind of play along at home. Uh, there are no prizes. Maybe maybe if there's a Patty in the audience, I'll, I'll send you a copy uh, of my book. But if we were to look in, in, in the, these text descriptions, there's nothing about those four bullet points that can help us determine is today's webinar and the number of registrations a signal or is it noise? 
What can do that is a process behavior chart. So here's a process behavior chart. It's drawn in our Kinexus software. We use Kinexus uh, within Kinexus. And we see going back to 2014, there's a historical pattern. There's an average of about 260 registrations. The lower limit is essentially zero. And then the upper limit is uh, a little bit over 500. So we had a webinar, uh, Jess Orr, who in fact, in fact, she's doing a webinar in January. We'll tell you about that later. Her webinar had over 700 registrations. That webinar was a signal because we had a data point above the upper limit. This was an unusual number of registrations. It's uh, not randomly occurring. So when we have a signal, this is a good use of the question, well, what changed? Do we know what happened? Otherwise, we're looking at um, each individual data point like today. Well, I've drawn in this orange line. Well, huh, it seems like we've had a number of webinars recently that have about 350 registrations. Today's data point falls within the range of noise. I mean, we could look and say, well, it's the third consecutive webinar above average. That could randomly occur. We could likely, it's possible, we can have three webinars in a row below the average. So we wanna make sure we don't overreact or spend time explaining or doing root cause analysis around uh, a data point or data points that are really just noise. We wanna filter out noise and react to signals. So we don't wanna spread ourselves too thin as an organization. If we're reacting to all of the noise on all of our metrics, that takes focus away from the signals that are meaningful. I, I, I'm sure you'd be sorely disappointed in me if I didn't have a process behavior chart on daily book sales about a book about process behavior charts. Because I likewise don't wanna overreact to every up and down in the number of books that are sold, whether I plot this on a daily basis or a weekly basis. So we can look back over time and say, well, huh, there's, there's a data point near the upper limit on August 4th. Well, August 4th was the official launch day for the ebook. So it's understandable why that data point, you, you could call that a near signal, but because there were, you know, maybe people were waiting for the official launch, they didn't want to pre-order, maybe more people heard about it on launch day launch day, we had a temporary spike, and then it goes back to uh, fluctuating around an average. Maybe that shouldn't be surprising. So we've got a lot of noise in the metric. It's a predictable metric. We're going forward, I could say, unless something changed, I'm probably going to sell between zero and 18 books a day. Now, I might not like where that average is. I could do things to try to boost the average, but the answer so the question of how do we improve the system is likely not going to come from asking, well, why was yesterday's sales above average? Questions like that, when it's a predictable metric and in the realm of noise, questions like that tend not to be very helpful. So as I continued over time and I'm fluctuating around an average, and then I had not just one, but two data points that were above the upper limit, two consecutive signals where I, as, as, a, as an author and as a publisher, could ask the question, what changed? What was different? The chart telling you that there's a signal doesn't tell you what changed. I don't know the answer to why I had a spike in sales those days. It could be something that was out of my control. Uh, somebody working at a company read the book and recommended it, um, sent an email to a large number of people internally, and that led to a spike in sales. That was uh, sort of a one-off unusual occurrence that's probably not going to continue happening every day. I would hope it would. But we can also look uh, at our charts over time and ask, did our change to the system or did a change to the system have a significant and or sustained effect on sales? So here's how things continued. You see that spike and then it went back down. It was fluctuating around an average. And then there was actually starting around September 4th, about eight consecutive data points or more than eight consecutive data points that were below the old average. That's a signal. Sales have unfortunately shifted downward. And so I can calculate a new average and a new upper limit. And with the, the exception of a few data points, you know, I have occasional spikes. But other than that, I, I would probably describe this as uh, a relatively um, routine 
uh, routine, uh, the, the, a predictable system with mostly routine variation. Now, I made a change to the system. I hired a PR firm in October, and I don't think that spike is because of their efforts. I would hope to see an increase in the average book sales, but I might also form a hypothesis that says, well, I wouldn't expect PR to be uh, a magic sales booster. It might not be an immediate effect. There might uh, be some lag time where it, you know I started working with them. That didn't mean I had uh, more articles out there or more interviews. It's going to take time to see the effect between uh, the change I made and the difference on sales. So we can look at a process behavior chart in um, terms of daily performance. We can also I can do a weekly process behavior chart where the average is higher, the upper limit is higher. It tells pretty much the same story where sales went up for a period, but now they're predictably uh, fluctuating around an average. But if we look at the, the last five data points, I see, well, huh, I've got five data points below the average. I don't know if this is the beginning of a shift or if this is part of the noise and uh, random fluctuation within the sales number. I guess in three more weeks, I, I might know um, the answer to that. So back to our game show of, is it a signal? Did something change significantly in the system? We can answer that question with process behavior charts. So I saw headlines about voter turnout in the 2018 US midterm elections. Headlines said things like this, uh, voter turnout soared. Well, I don't know the statistical definition of the word soared, that's a descriptive term. Americans turned out to vote at a level not seen in more than a century. We know from looking at other data sets that some data point being the highest in X number of years doesn't necessarily mean it's statistically um, out of line with um, noise and routine fluctuation. The highest turnout since before World War I. So a better way to communicate numbers instead of headlines and descriptions, uh, the, the, the new site Vox.com, had a headline here about record setting voter turnout. Well, what do we mean by record setting? Highest level in a century. Well, and they created a chart. So this is, this is better than the text descriptions. It goes back to 1912. And you might look and say, well, it's kind of it's fluctuating around an average of about 40%. It was fluctuating a little bit more tightly, maybe from 1976 to um, 2014. So I would much rather see a chart like this in a news story, it tells us so much more than text comparisons or text descriptions. But we can go back and look at even more context. So I was able to pull data from a website that Vox recommended going back all the way to 1790. So th th this chart shows every midterm election in United States history. Let's say, well, would we, what does this tell us? Was 2018 really record setting? Well, maybe in the context of the last 50 years, but I think this chart should, tells a really different story. So I think this, this makes an argument for why we wanna be careful in showing all, a chart that only has this year's data in the workplace, or even a chart that only shows last year's data. We, we wanna be careful that we're um, not showing such a limited time frame that it changes the conclusions that we would draw um, based on that view. Because it looks like um, voter turnout numbers used to be in the 60 to 70 percent range, and then it was roughly, and then it fell off, and then in World War One it really fell off again. And then it looks like around World War Two it really dropped, and then it maybe dropped. It was back up, and it dropped maybe it was, say Nixon and, and Watergate. But I think there's really no substitute, even for just a simple run chart. Um, even if we're not going with the full-blown process behavior chart methodology. But of course, I'm tempted to do a process behavior chart. So if we go back to 1974, just kind of after that post-Watergate drop, 1974 to 2014, this really looks like a predictable system that the average midterm voter turnout was about 40%, some years higher, some years lower, some years right on the number, 2014 was down. So what would we have predicted? We have all this noise. For 2018, 
we would have predicted unless something changed that voter turnout, it might have regressed back to the mean. We don't know if 2014 was the beginning of a trend or if it was just fluctuation. That 2018 would be somewhere between about 34 and 45 percent. Well, here's the data point. 2018 voter turnout of almost 50 percent is a signal. It's a data point above the old upper limit. We could ask what changed. We'll just leave it to you to think about that and uh, discuss that uh, maybe after the webinar. Something changed in the system. The process behavior chart tells us that. It's up to our own understanding of the system, whether that means our political system or a workplace system, to understand and answer the question, what changed and why? So let's look at another situation. Is it a signal? Are emergency room waiting times improving or not? So a friend of mine who uh, lives and works in Winnipeg, Manitoba, sends me an article almost every month. We see headlines that say things like, the wait times are higher. Wait times have dropped by 16% compared to last year, but they rose in recent months. Wait times are still among the worst, but getting better. ER wait times continue to stall. So it's like the story changes every month. Things are getting better or nope, this month we say it's getting worse or maybe one month the headline says, well, eh, it's just stalled. So we could use lots and lots of words to say really nothing conclusive. So from these different articles, you know, one says wait times um, were virtually the same. And I, and I think that's a good way of looking at it. Is there a significant difference between 1.5 hours and 1.58 hours? Maybe not. One number is higher than the other, but maybe they are virtually the same. It's largely unchanged because the numbers fluctuate from month to month. Now we're getting to something. Um, somebody from uh, the, the health organization said, we're going in the right direction. And I think April is showing that. Well, any one data point might not really prove that statistically. We might want to paint that picture, but we have to be careful and not be misleading through our um, kind of verbal description of data. The times fluctuate from month to month. There's variation. And someone said, I think this is spot on too, it's more useful to look at longer term trends and not just compare data. So the province, or this is the, the Winnipeg Regional Health uh, Authority, I might have the acronym wrong, but the WRHA posts the times for different hospitals and compared to the month before. They also compare it to the same month last year. And we see this in workplace data. I mean, this is workplace data of sorts um, as well. It's really hard to draw conclusions from tables of numbers. We do better charting and, um, and plotting it visually. Uh, the comparisons like this, not real helpful. So if we plot the dots, so I had to cobble together from different news articles and there are some data points missing, but when we plot the dots, this tells us a different picture than any of those ups and downs, those descriptions in a headline or an article might have implied. Now they made a change to the system in October, 2017 that was intended to reduce waiting times. So this is where we can use a process behavior chart to uh, ask and, and try to answer the question, did the countermeasure make a difference? Look and say, well, it really doesn't look like it did. It looks like it's still fluctuating in basically the same range as before. So we could draw a, pro draw a process behavior chart. And I would draw the conclusion that, well, it's still fluctuating pretty much the same as it had been before um, that change to the system. But we go back and look, uh, you see these three data points that are circled. We've actually got uh, what I would call a rule um, three signal of three consecutive data points. You know, Two of them are just slightly closer to the upper limit than they are to the average. That's an interesting time to ask what changed. Now it's January, February, March. It could be uh, just seasonality. It could be uh, within the realm of noise. If we look at a slightly different data set, this is for the whole province of Manitoba, a run chart going back to 2013. I mean, again, it looks like there's some February seasonality, but to me that all looks like noise without drawing, without calculating and drawing the average and the lower and upper limits. You can kind of start to eyeball it and say, well, that really looks like it's stable and predictable. 
And I wouldn't expect waiting times to change dramatically in the future unless there was some real significant change made to the system. So it, let's play another round of, is it a signal? Did something change significantly? We can look at data and we see a lot of headlines around, uh, sorry, this is grim. I guess it's related to emergency room uh, data in a way, traffic accident deaths. We say headlines that report a number, it's the lowest in 27 years, uh, continues to climb, but the rate has stabilized. It's trending higher. Um, it's one headline, the, the 2018 numbers in December are nearing the 2017 numbers. Well, it sounds like it's pretty much the same. But descriptions like that, again, don't really tell us much. Two data points don't tell us much. Two data points are not a trend. Here's an article I found getting real detailed. Chattanooga, Tennessee, headline says, significant increase in traffic fatalities in 2018. So you can look at it for the city, you can look at it for the county, and there's nothing from these two data points that would really allow me to draw a conclusion if that change from 18 to 27 is noise or if it's a signal. I would wanna see more historical data to be able to uh, determine that. And they said, well, factually correct, it's a 33% increase. That still doesn't help us answer if it's signal or if it's noise. USA Today talked about crash deaths falling slightly. It's the second deadliest year in the last decade. Again, that doesn't mean um, it's a, a statistical signal. Uh, the number of people killed was down 1.8% from the year before. Fatalities declined 3.1%. The number of deaths per 100 million miles, so if it's expressed as a rate, that fell 2.5%. So we've got to do more than just make comparisons of two data points. The National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration has a website and reports with dense tables of numbers, percentage changes. That doesn't really help us determine if there's trends. If we could look at the annual numbers, and some years are up, some years are down, even if we color code it. Some years are green, the number's down, and some years the number is back up. In the report, they show a chart now this is showing the percentage change. So we see some years where the number's up, some years the number is down. Um, there, there's this phrase mental gymnastics that gets used. And I think effective charts don't require uh, mental gymnastics on the part of the user. Instead of plotting the percentage change, why not plot the actual number? So here's the quarterly number. If we look at it as uh, a run chart and a process behavior chart, we could say, well, that looks like noise. There might be a pattern where the first quarter of each year is generally lower than the other three quarters, which is surprising. I would think uh, wintertime traffic in, in Q1, wintertime weather um, would, would cause more accidents. But if we step back and look at annual fatalities, we see generally data that's fluctuating within a range. But going back to 2007, we might ask, well, what was different about 2007? What changed going from 2007 to 2008? You know, for a lot of the explanations that are given for traffic fatalities, um, smartphones and distracted driving, some of that has really become more of a problem since 2007. So when we look at charts like this, we can look for signals that that doesn't replace knowledge and understanding of the system. It doesn't ask, answer the question, why did things change? So in a workplace, we go to the Gemba, we talk to people, we investigate, um, we have to draw those cause and effect relationships on our own. Uh, fatality rates in recent years seem to be fluctuating where um, as much as the headline in 2016 might have said the numbers are up from the year before, or headlines said the numbers are down in 2017, it might not really be worth over explaining. We can do things as society to reduce the average, the number and the rate of fatalities. We can do things to improve safety. But again, the answer to that challenge won't be found in looking at any one year uh, and, and its data point. So there was an article in USA Today, um, NHTSA officials were encouraged, it declined slightly, 
but it's not cause for celebration. So they might recognize that this that numbers are in the realm of rain uh, of noise. Heidi King said there is no single reason for the decline. That's a perfect way of explaining noise. There is no single reason. If there was a signal in the data, there might be a reason or an explanation or a cause, but I think they're right to not overreact to every up and down in the data. Final point from NHTSA, they, in their reports, they use lots and lots of words to try to describe, I think, what is um, portrayed much more effectively in a visual chart. Uh, you get down the rabbit hole of uh, NHTSA data, you, you see reports and websites about pedestrian safety. Um, there's a number of people who were killed. That number declined 1.7%. What can we really, can we draw any conclusions from that? It was the second highest number in the previous 27 years. You can, you can always do that type of analysis, but it might not really tell you anything. There's a big box on their website comparing this, you know, the, the one number to the year before. That doesn't, I mean, uh, it tells you, it doesn't even tell you, you know, what the average is. It doesn't tell you if that year uh, is a signal or if it's noise. It said pedestrian fatalities, 26% of them occur between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., which sounds shocking. But you figure if people are sleeping eight hours a day and they're out being pedestrian 16 hours a day, three out of 16 hours, that's 19% of the day. Like the fact that 26% occur during 19% of the day. Again, that might be uh, a description of noise as opposed to some meaningful conclusion. I mean, we could all decide, let's stop being pedestrians between six and 9 p.m., but that might not really uh, be practical. It might not do anything to reduce pedestrian fatalities. I mean, I guess if we all stop being pedestrians, but you know, that's not gonna happen. So if we draw a process behavior chart, we can see, well, this looks less like a predictable system compared to some other data sets. So we have a low number. Was anything different in 2009? We have numbers that are above the calculated limits in 2016 and 2017. Did something change? Is this more uh, a matter of more people walking with smartphones and being distracted? A more accurate way of drawing that process behavior chart might be to see, uh, to, to represent it as a shift where it was fluctuating around an average. And then it looks like maybe around 2015, we had some uh, jump upward. The chart showing us that there's, there's a signal doesn't tell us um, why that signal is there. It doesn't tell us what changed. We need to ask that and figure that out. So back to, is it a signal? Did our change or does our proposed change have an effect? So people thankfully are trying to improve the system in ways that would reduce the number of pedestrian fatalities. In a workplace, we sometimes need to go test different possible countermeasures. So here's an article, Washington DC wants to eliminate right turns on red. Will it really save lives? Well, as we find in the workplace, many countermeasures are um, controversial or we find people with opinions on both sides. There are some experts who say, well, turning right on red is dangerous for people. It's dangerous for pedestrians. There are other experts who say, well, banning right turns on red are unlikely to increase safety. It might actually decrease safety. It might actually increase risk. So this, I think, comes back to an important workplace question around cause and effect relationships, making a change and evaluating to see if we made a difference on the system or not. So I'm, I'm sort of making up data going forward here to play some what if scenarios. So here was our past performance. And let's say at the end of 2017, Washington DC had banned right turns on red. So if 2018 showed a data point like this below the lower limit, we'd say that's a strong signal. Now, was that a one-time blip or is it gonna be sustained? We don't know yet. Was this reduction caused by the right turn on red ban? There might not, we might not know that for sure, but we might have a solid hypothesis about that being the case. So here's some of the real world messiness. We make a change, we see an impact. Do we feel comfortable and confident in the cause and effect relationship that may or may not have taken place? It could be that there were other factors that led to that drop. 
all other things being equal, banning right turns on red might have had no difference or a small difference or a negative impact. Let's say 2018's data point looked like this. It was below average, but that single data point is not a signal. Is that within the realm of noise or is it the start of a shift where we might see eight consecutive data points below the average or maybe next year is gonna be below the lower limit? We don't know yet. Was that reduction caused by the right turn on red ban? We don't know for sure. And as we add data points over time, even these three data points, not a signal, we don't know if that's the start of a shift. Would we give up on the right turn on red ban? Maybe not. That's part of the judgment that's required when people are managing uh, a system. Would we try something new? These are judgment calls to be made. But then let's say the data played out like this through 2025. We'd, we'd call that a weak signal, but it's a sustained change. We're now fluctuating around a lower average. So we have some improvement. We haven't solved the problem, but we've made things better. Is that caused by the right turn on red band? Again, that's, that's a judgment call. So when we're playing, is it a signal? We want to make sure we have a better understanding of cause and effect relationships. So I, I, I don't mean to pick on them, but I'm going to use an example from a hospital that I visited earlier this year where there, there was a presentation being given. And somebody said about a project and a metric very definitively, we made a big impact and it ticked back up. Well, let's look at the numbers. Let's plot the dots. So they had two data points measuring uh, a, a time, uh, the, the time delay in getting patients admitted. The third data point that they described as a big impact is here. Well, that data point's lower than the previous two, but is that in the realm of noise or it is, a, is it a signal? So they described a quote unquote big impact. Then they said, well, it ticked back up. The data point did that. Now, four data points is the bare minimum that's required to do the calculations for a process behavior chart. It's not the world's greatest process behavior chart, but it's at least useful. Process behavior chart with those four data points looks like this. I wouldn't draw a conclusion that there was either a big impact or an uptick. Like to me, it really looks like that metric is just fluctuating around an average. Now we need to think about that project that we did or that countermeasure that we put in place. Are we fooling ourselves in a way that's harmful, that gets in the way of improvement? If, if we want to tell a story that says, yes, we made a big impact and that maybe isn't really true, um, we need to go back through some PDSA cycles and, and try something else and try again to really make a significant impact that would be measured, it would be uh, made visible in terms of being a signal in the chart. All right, so let's play lightning round. Is it a signal? See different headlines. Um, are US companies expanding factories? So there's a survey that said, well, we saw the largest share in at least a decade. Well, the Wall Street Journal drew a chart. I think, oh, look at that last data point. For once, that actually looks like a signal. And we do a process behavior chart, sure enough. That's a very strong system. That's something changed in the system that's leading uh, a significantly number of higher, a higher number of factories to say, we plan on expanding. It doesn't tell you why, but it tells you something changed. Article about uh, buying gifts here in the holiday season that was anticipated to be 18% higher in 27, uh, compared to 2017. Wall Street Journal provided uh, a chart. Now the y-axis axis here is a little bit uh, skewed or misleading perhaps. We draw a process behavior chart and we look and say, well, I don't see any of these years being a signal. It's not a significant difference from year to year. That might not be headline worthy. It might not be worth explaining. I'd be curious 2019, that number um, might fluctuate down or it could be continuing up as part of a linear trend. And I'll, I'll share an example of like that in a couple of minutes. It's an example from an organization I saw presenting about increasing internal customer satisfaction. And they were celebrating, we're above our goal for the first time. And we're above our goal two quarters in a row, the goal being that red line. Drawing this as a process behavior chart shows us that, well, yeah, it looks like we, I would call that a signal. 
But the evidence of that is not being above the goal. The goal happens to be coincidentally near the upper limit. The threshold of the criteria I would use for saying, yes, we really made a difference is comparing to the red line instead of comparing to the goal. It's an article about Tesla warranty costs, that the expense per vehicle fell sharply in Q3. So I've doctored the chart. If all we're looking at is the last two data points, I don't know if that is within the realm of noise or if it's a signal. Here's the complete chart from the Wall Street Journal, looking at the bigger picture. Well, huh, Q2 2018, that, that stands out a little bit. Is the headline that it fell dramatically going from Q2 to Q3? Or maybe the, the noteworthy thing is, uh, what is looking at is, is Q2 uh, a signal? But you know, drawing a process behavior chart using all six of these data points as the baseline would suggest, well, no, Q2 was higher, but it's not a signal, statistically speaking. Or... And this is where you know there's gray area. When we're choosing a period for a baseline, we um, we don't want to be arbitrary about it. But if we knew the system was different for some reason in Q2, if we had only used the first four data points as the baseline, then Q2 would show itself to be a signal. As a user of the chart, the question here is asking, well, do we know what happened? Do we know what the change was or, or not? So there, there's sometimes some gray area. I'm not saying you should choose baselines uh, in a way that proves the point you want to make. But I think when we chart the data and, and, and look past comparisons of two data points, we, do, um, we would do a lot better. All right, so we are, we're starting to run short on time and I was worried about this. So I've got a section here, is it a signal? Making comparisons at a point in time. I'm gonna leave this for a, a follow-up bonus webinar. Um, I'll record that and we'll send a link um, out to people. But one other thing I wanna show you because this comes up a lot in time series data is what we call chunky data. This is a technical term. So if we have a, a chart for um, central line associated bloodstream infections, here's a chart from an organization and, and the number of infections is either one or two. And the problem with a chart like this with relatively rare events and a, and a low average around one, the way the calculations work, like basically every event, everything looks like noise. And so a recommendation or what I was taught, if you have something that's chunky or has, you know, kind of, uh, there, there's not much range of variation or these are rare events. An alternative is to plot the days between those rare events. So every event gets a plot on the, the chart and we see we're fluctuating around an average. And then we've got two points here where the days between infections was much longer than would be um, randomly expected. Those are signals where we would again ask what changed, what happened. So that paints a little bit different picture of the system. So then we need to go and investigate and say, well, does, does it seem like we made a change to the system? Does this properly accurately reflect reality or does the other view. That's part of the judgment call and some of the nuance in using this methodology. And then I'm also going to skip a scenario and I'll, I'll do a separate follow-up bonus uh, webinar about scenarios where instead of fluctuating around an average, we're fluctuating around uh, a linear increase. So I was afraid I was biting off more than I, than I could chew in this webinar and it turns out to be the case. But I wanna leave time for Q&A um, and uh, we'll get everyone done on time. So as we wrap up today's edition of Is It a Signal? I think there are some key points to remember from these examples and our workplace scenarios. When we react less, when we stop reacting to the noise and every up and down in a metric, when we lead better, when we do a better job of uh, understanding cause and effect relationships, whether we're leading improvement or leading an organization, that's helpful. 
when we react less and lead better, we can improve more because that's really the goal. The goal is not drawing technically correct or precise charts. The goal is improving our performance. And again, we can probably do that um, by being more systematic, reacting less to every data point, every blip up and down, and stepping back and asking, how do we improve the system? And then use process behavior charts to tell if we've made a significant difference or not. So thanks for watching. It's a signal. Don't forget to draw your process behavior charts. Thanks. <clears throat> Greg, I'll hand it over to you and do the announcements and what's coming yeah. soon. That, that, that was so great. I have a, a sheet filled with notes and we also have a bunch of comments and questions as well. So if you haven't put in your question yet, please do that. I do want to give a, um, a anecdote though about how you changed my approach in, in leading and or just simply asking questions. And uh, I'd like to perhaps think that because we were doing that fallacy that, that pushed you towards writing this book and mm -hmm. us gaining yep. a lot more information about this. But we were, and this was a couple of years back, with, with every change in the data, uh, I, um, the, the, the division that, that I'm referring to is, is marketing. And it, marketing is easy to pick on because usually marketing just has lots of great data. And um, it can you know, be sliced weekly, monthly, daily. And I was asking our director of marketing, Maggie Millard, oh, well, why did the number go up or why did the number go down? And, and I really thought I was coming at it from a really good approach because it wasn't like a blame. Um, I, I really would always ask, well, what can we learn about that? And uh, I did that. I think you saw me do it about three or four times. And, and mm -hmm. then you, you gave us some, some really great insight into really using um, this type of, of thinking. And to me, it, it's so critical because you know, as leaders or as people that are leading the interpretation of data, um, you really need to figure out, well, how do you spend your time during the day? And is it providing value to your company, to your customers? And by me asking questions that really didn't need to be asked, I was basically diverting resources to mm -hmm. asking either to, trying to answer a question that one shouldn't have been asked or two really doesn't have an answer. And so I, I think aside from it stopping you from doing an activity that on its surface appears to be an activity that gives value, but in reality gives absolutely no value. Um, I think that people need to, to, to be able to do this because I think it's going to make them better leaders in general and, and have better outcomes from it. So I just can't tell everyone that's listening how important this this topic is. And if you haven't read the book yet, I would read the book. I'm currently um, uh, almost mostly done with your book, Mark, at this point. And I think it's great to, to get reading and then to hear it audio and kind of go back and forth. And uh, I just don't know if you could overemphasize the, the concepts that you're presenting on. Well, thanks, Greg. All right, so let's get in with some of the questions. Um, oh, we have announcements first. Oh, 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 yes, uh, announcement. Thank you. This is the, the problem when someone's hosting that doesn't normally um, host. So probably the, the the biggest thing to note is is that Jess Orr is going to be providing a webinar on applying strategy deployment to your personal goals on January 10th. You may have remembered that her prior webinar was highlighted as a signal in one of the examples. And so she's an excellent uh, speaker, and I know people will get lots of benefit from it. Keep in mind that we have all of our webinars on our website at connexus.com forward slash webinars. And so you, we, we have just a huge catalog now. We've been doing this for a number of years. So yeah. please take a look there and see if anything piques your interest. Additionally, we spent a lot of time producing um, knowledge and disseminating knowledge and sharing knowledge from people outside of Kinexus as well. The, on, our, on our blog, we have a improvement as well as a customer blog. Check those out at Kinexus.com as well and subscribe. You can do it daily or weekly. And uh, finally, the, the way I listen to most of our webinars is through our podcast because we often max out our, our webinars as we did this time. And I don't want to take 
someone else's space off. And so I listen to all of our webinars via podcast form. So you can subscribe to them in all of the ways you would normally subscribe to your podcast. And we love people that um, give us five star reviews because it helps us be found by other people. And uh, finally, now we can um, get to questions, which is what I was anticipating getting too much sooner. <laughs> Here's all the, the, the websites and the ways to connect with us socially or on social media as well. Well, let's get into the, the first question that um, I thought was uh, good. And uh, it's from Brian. And the question is, how to determine the natural upper and lower limits? Well, um, I mean, th those are calculated um, off of uh, a baseline. Um, there's a article, and I think it, it, it'll be sent out. In the follow-up, there, there's a blog post on the Connexus website and an existing webinar. Um, just, I, th I think, for the sake of time here, I'll, I'll just point people to that. Perfect. And then, if you could just comment, I, I know sometimes people talk about needing 20 prior data points, but can you comment on, let's say, you don't have 20 data points, can yeah. you still calculate those? Yeah, I mean, what you know, Don Wheeler, who I mean, you know, he's the 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 PhD statistician who. Um, I've, I've learned this from, um, you know, he says, ideal is to have 15 to 20 baseline data points. There's diminishing returns. So as we get beyond 15 to 20 baseline data points and, and using those for calculating the average and the limits, the fit, um, you know, the kind of the preciseness of the chart gets better. So if we only start with four or six or, or eight data points, that chart's to me, better than nothing, there's a risk that we have um, a, a data point, we, we might get a false signal, or we might have a, uh, a near signal, like something near the limits, those, those limits are being calculated off of a relatively small number of data points, that the, the, the process behavior chart's not quite as precise as it would be with a bigger uh, baseline. But I, I think where that process behavior chart, or even if it's just a run chart is helpful, is to look and say, well, huh, it's is it fluctuating around an average or not? Like even some of those um, very qualitative assessments of a chart um, to, to look if there's really a trend or if it's just noise. Um, you know, so I, 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 you know, if I only had four or six data points, I would start with that. As I add more data points, I would calculate more precise limits. But then when I got to about 15, I, I would stop recalculating. You're not supposed to constantly recalculate the limits. It's not a moving average over time. You're really supposed to establish a baseline. And if you have a predictable system and a predictable metric, look for signals that it's no longer uh, predictable in that same way. So establish a baseline uh, and look for signals based on those limits and um, kind of the three core rules that are most useful. The three rules for finding signals. And to, to repeat those rules, just I think repeating those rules is super important. Yeah. I mean, any one data point outside of the limits eight consecutive above or below the average. And, you know, there are, there are different, you know, there, there's statistical gray area. There are some who say seven consecutive points and some who say it's nine consecutive points. You know, I, some of that I think is, is, is quibbling. Um, and then the third rule about three out of four data points that are closer to a limit than they are to the average. And, you know, there, there are additional rules that could be used. There's sets called the Western Electric Rules and the Nelson Rules. And um, over time, I've, I've, I've scaled back the number of rules that I've used because, you know, I think from Wheeler's work, he does a good job of pointing out that when you add more rules, you certainly, for one, you add more complexity. This becomes harder to teach. And then you also increase the risk of a false signal um, that, that happens over time. Okay, there's a, a number of comments from Sergey, and based on those comments, I think he is from Russia. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, one of the one of the points that um, that he made what he made, which was one of the things I was thinking of, I'll just say it is that news has a different purpose though. Their goal is to make noise look like signal to get people to read them more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, 
I, 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 yeah, so I would hope in an organization the purpose for our metrics is um, to, to better drive improvement, to better understand cause and effect relationships. That's a good point. The point of the media sometimes might be um, to attract eyeballs and get clicks and get ratings. Um, so fair enough. But, um, you know, I think, unfortunately, the, the pattern that the, 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 the lesson that um, people get from the news then gets translated into the workplace where, um, uh, you know, where, where we should we need we need to do better uh, with our statistical analysis in the workplace. Great. And there's I'll pick out one of the comments that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, his question is with the pro with processes with significant variation, it is harder to distinguish signals from noise, but it is dependent on the selection of the time period. Well, um, so I mean, I think the, the one question there, if you've got a system, a metric that's fluctuating more from period to period, then that goes into the calculation that gets reflected in the calculation of the lower and upper limits. So a system with more inherent variation will have wider limits, which then, you know, so it might be a very noisy system, but the process behavior charts will still help us detect a, a signal. If we've got a metric that's fluctuating within a very narrow band, then those limits are gonna be calculated to be narrower. So this is where saying, you know, a 33% change in a metric in some metrics, that might be very much in the realm of noise because it goes up and down 30 to 40% every period. There might be some metrics that normally fluctuate plus or minus 2% to where a 33% change would absolutely be a signal. So that's where that's part of the limitation of a two data point comparison of a percentage change comparison. I have no idea if a number that sounds like a large difference uh, is really a signal or not. Quick comment from Lori, um, excellent webinar. Love to encourage people to show data to show the real situation. Very often folks hide the truth or refer and distract with not false but misleading information. I, I'm bringing up this comment because she's thanking us for illustrating um, by using Winnipeg, Manitoba Health Authority. They are leading the way in health transition. Thank you, Mark, excellent. Um, another another question on differentiating between the upper and, and lower and then how to set those. So I, I'm, I'm seeing an, an, a follow-up webinar here, perhaps talking a little bit about that, talking about if you don't have dates and you want to do kind of disconnected groups, clustering, and an increasing trend. I, I would love to host that with you, Mark, if I could convince you to let me do that. Um, and then probably for our last question here, how can one use this methodology to evaluate the success of PDSA cycles without waiting too long to have greater than four data points? Well, I mean, so one way to address that is um, where you can do a daily metric instead of a weekly metric or a weekly metric instead of a, a monthly metric. Um, you know, the more data points we have, um, the more quickly uh, we can detect the signal. And you know when we do a, a, a metric that's more frequent, you know a daily metric is going to have more variation day to day than a weekly metric will have. I see that in my book sales metrics. Mm -hmm. um, but when you calculate the limits, that prevents you from overreacting to the ver the higher variation in the daily metric. The, the calculated limits on the daily metric will be wider than the calculated limits on a weekly metric. So there's there's kind of that, that counterbalance where you've got more data points more frequently, which helps you detect signals more quickly, and the process behavior chart methodology prevents you from overreacting to the noise or confusing uh, noise with signal. That's great. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I never thought that, that there's so much science and business coming from a healthcare background where I thought, oh, I'm kind of far more in science than, than an average person. It's pretty clear I mean, to me, these statistical kind of application into to business um, is, is as robust, if, if maybe even needed more because folks don't have that kind of background. I and mean, this is just such a great topic. So thank you, Mark, for, for sharing your expertise. And um, 
I think look forward to more webinars on this. And uh, Mark, any final remarks? Um, well, well, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, I, I worry sometimes if this is too esoteric of a topic uh, for people to really um, get excited about or interested in. But you know, I've it, it's been um, you know I, I look at you know book sales and book reviews are in a way sort of a vanity metric using the Eric Reese lean startup approach. What what matters more to me is when I've gotten uh, you know emails from people saying we're using process behavior charts. They're mirroring your examples, Greg. Of, you know, we're, rea we're wasting less time reacting to the noise. We're stepping back. We're doing an A3. We're improving the system. And we're actually moving the needle on our metrics. Like Those are the stories that I'm really excited about. I hope people will incorporate um, these methods into lean daily management and, and strategy deployment um, where there's metrics at those different levels. I, I would encourage people to do more. And I'd love to hear about what you're working on, whether um, you've got questions or you just kind of want to um, share what you're doing. Um, look forward to hearing more of that from people. So thank you uh, for tuning in and I want to wish everyone happy holidays as well. Happy holidays and happy new year. And in the famous words of the Ben and Rippy show, we'll see you kind next time. <laughs>